this was something really scary. Attention. Do I have everybody's attention now? Hey, now it's overtime with uh, Mike and JD. I'm your host, Mike Gilbert. What's up, JD? I think I need to redo the animations because I really like the new logos. Yeah. And <clears throat> they need to be tweaked. And currently in my higher level graphics classes, I got kids doing After Effects work. So I think I could scab off one of them and tell them, hey, you need to make me an animation for my podcast because I told you to. Yeah. So I think I think I need to do that. Okay, well, I'll send you over the the, the images. I'll, I'll email them to you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we, we definitely need one for the Mike and JD show and for uh, this one. Um, and then I need to update like that logo up in the top left. I need to yeah. swap that over. Yeah. Um, do you have just do you have just the circular logo? I, so I'll be honest right now. That's so funny. Cause, uh, cause well, ladies and gentlemen, JD was a few minutes late cause the computer crapped out on him. I did have a computer. I was crap. trying to, I was trying to do that. Cause on, on the iPhone, you can just hold your finger on the button and then it'll cut out the background and make it transparent for you. Right. Mm -hmm. Well on this logo, it's so complicated. It, it actually doesn't do that. And so I, uh, I send it to my wife who happens to be editing photos as we speak. I said, Hey, can you make this a transparent image? Just all I want is the globe, the microphone, and the Mike and JD show. So she said she'll she'll just knock it out for us. Oh, it's super easy in Photoshop. You yeah. just you do an object select, boom, click on it, and then you go just make a new project, transparent background, boom, boom, slap, slap, and then you make it a PNG. Piece yeah, I just I just can't access the the Photoshop on this computer for some reason because we have two different profiles on the computer, mm -hmm. and it's on my wife's profile. And uh, me trying to run it at the same time, I don't think this computer has enough memory anymore. It's an old computer. It's from 2017. Okay. So um, it's probably time to, to upgrade the old MacBook here uh, to get something new. Yeah, mine's getting a little bit older, too, and it's a little scary. I got a laptop for school that I don't really want to use for personal stuff. But, um, you know, I'm in the same boat right now, so I don't want to. Like, everything's been good. Yeah. You never know. Because like, we bought tons of extra processor power on this thing, so but you never know. So, like I said, send me stuff too, man. I'm, I I work on a I work at a school and I law I'm on Photoshop all day long. Yeah, yeah. No, I I I def I definitely will. Just my wife. Um, so we bought her one of those uh, iPads with like the um the pen, so she oh, can yeah, do yeah, yeah. photography. So that's what she does that because it's so much easier for her to use the pen on certain things. I There's other things she has to use a computer for more complicated mm -hmm. stuff, but. For the most part, quick touch-ups, she can just use her, her tablet to do uh, some of her photography. Now that she's no longer in school, uh, once she has the baby, I think she's going to take some gigs again by the end of the year. Yeah, I can see that. Um, I've seen I had a lot of friends that draw comics and stuff like that, and a lot of them are using the iPad. with their, It's like the stylus is modeled off of Cintiq, which is like drawing on, you know, yeah. digitally, essentially. So like it, it really does a good job mirroring that. And the new Photoshop, man, it's pretty cool. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with it, especially you'd love it with like AI. Tool. yeah that's our next yeah. lesson actually is ai <laughs> yeah i think every every system going forward is going to have some type of ai component for sure you know, which is smart i'm mean, like you got to adapt with with the world there's so much there's so much anti-ai sentiment in any type of an art community that because it was trained rather unethically and i can admit yeah. that but at this point the 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 genie is out of the toothpaste tube, <laughs> yeah. you know? So yeah. like, there's not, I mean, there's nothing you can really do about it. It's either kind of get on board or like get left behind. It's adapt or perish, right? It's it one is, of those, it it's one of those oh. deals. So, I mean, like I'm, I got to teach, I got to teach the kids how to do it because like, I'm going to have, what am I? I'm a hypocrite. Like I did a bunch, I do a bunch of AI stuff too. So, I mean, I don't know, man, it, it gets, it's, it's super, it's a super hot button issue right now. So I feel like you got to learn it. Like I told you my, my new plan, I'm going to start it this week. So we'll see how that goes on. Yeah. I'm really interested to see how that plays out. Me too. Um, Me too. Yeah. So, uh, man, I had something for the start of the show and I already forgot. Oh, I pooched it. Sorry, man. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, oh, it's all good. So uh, tonight got, on, go ahead. Real quick. Friday. I go in, I got third period class, right? I told you, 
uh, at the regular show that I had a kid, like I, I rearranged his Photoshop project, I held him out. And I said, Cody goes here. Roman goes here. He goes, Oh, you like pro wrestling? I'm like, yeah. I said, you should Google me in pro wrestling sometime. So I just said it offhandedly thinking he'd find my articles and stuff like that. He comes in Friday morning, leans over my desk and goes, Hey, Mr. Leva, I watched your podcast last night. Oh no. And I, this is what I said. I said, did you really? He's like, yeah, you guys are really good. And I said, well, thanks, but don't tell anybody I can't get fired yet. I don't have tenure. <laughs> And he's like, no, no, don't worry about it. How much is your Patreon? And I was oh, like, oh man, well, five dollars a month gets you access to. <laughs> and he's like, that's cheap. I know people do like twenty dollars a month. And I'm like, yeah, not us. So, no. so perhaps we found a patron, a new patron. I don't know. I'm not comfortable with this one. <laughs> that's that's so funny. My wife was at lunch today with two of her friends, and they were like, she goes, uh, they want to listen to your podcast. I go, no. She goes, why not? And I go. Because their their husbands are also in the military, I was like, "Look, this is my nerd stuff," and I said, "You guys can just leave me the hell alone." <laughs> it's just like legit my words. It's like you guys just leave me alone. I don't I don't share the podcast on Facebook because that Facebook is for family mm-hmm. and Twitter is for bullshit, and that's where I that's where I share that stuff. So I'm I'm of the same mind, but I had to share our big news on Facebook for the handful of people yes. who would appreciate it. So, I mean, there weren't many, I didn't get many likes cause I'm sure most people didn't know <laughs> what the hell I was talking about, but for those that knew. Yeah. Right. So that's what I wanted to start the show off with. I, I remember seen. now. Mm-hmm. Um, so JD and I have been trying for two years now to become wrestling observer newsletter, hall of fame voters. Um, and Mostly. we actually did, Mostly Mike. I had no hope this would ever happen. Like, I'm like, we're never, he's never going to let yeah. us do this. Well, well, last year we did a couple of episodes on the Hall of Fame. Like, we did a whole preview show where we basically, you know, submitted our ballot. If we were to have a ballot, this is what we would submit. We did a show like that. And, um, and when the Hall of Fame got announced, we actually kind of ran down, like, some of the people that, that made it. We didn't really go too in detail after that because we had already, you know, talked about them uh, ahead of time. And so I did that. We did that show and I submitted it to Dave Meltzer last year. And I think it was just too late. I don't think it was like, he didn't think we were worthy. I think it was just too late. Cause he was probably already pretty aware of us by that point, because we've been working with Garrett so much. Mm-hmm. We had already done shows on the network. I'd already done two episodes of fight game. And I'd done a couple episodes with Josh Nason and JD had already been on there before. So like we've been on the network and we, we have enough friends that know Dave um, that I was like, I don't think he's sliding us in any way. I think I've had lunch just, with Dave twice. Yeah. Yeah. You've met him. I've met him. Mm. So like, and, and we've interacted several times. Me and him got in that whole controversy over Baron Corbin years ago. Like, That's where, right. <laughs> yeah, he, he wrote about me in his newsletter at one point. So he's like, a- we like we're, he's aware of us. Okay. Mm-hmm. Not that we're like on his mind all the time, but he just knows who we are. Um, so we, we talked to uh, Joe Lanza and, and Rich. And then we also uh, plugged uh, John Muse. We said, hey, man, can you just shoot Dave an email? Now, I don't know that Joe and Rich sent an email, but I can confirm that John sent one. And uh, he sent an email over. And then just last night, out of the blue, because I heard that the, the ballots were going out, John was like, you just email him. So I, I went ahead and just sent him an email. I, I shared our show from last year uh, about, the, about the Hall of Fame. And within minutes, I got a reply with my ballot. It, w- it was that easy. I was, you told me that, that's, and so I was, the, we were staying in a hotel, right? And I had to walk the dog at one in the morning. So I looked at my phone while I was half asleep walking the dog outside the hotel. And you, te- I saw your text saying, email Dave. And I wrote like the most incomprehensible 1 a.m. email of all time. <laughs> and I woke up the next morning, did I really do that? I'm like, oh man. <laughs> And then I got the, I got the ballot. I'm like, holy shit, we, we stuck the landing on this one. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Uh, we also got a credit to it's due to another friend of ours, old Jeremy Feinstone. I know texted Dave and also told him he should give us a ballot. So we did have some angels looking out for us. So I, I didn't know about Feinstone. Really? I didn't I he I did not know that. He didn't tell me that. Yeah, he did. I don't know if I'm supposed oh. to tell you that, but I did. So yeah. well, 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 yeah, thank you, Jeremy. I really appreciate good, that. Good dude. We have good friends. We have good friends. Yeah. Yeah, good friends that advocate for us. So, uh, I, you know what? I know it's weird that that actually means a lot to me, but it really does. <laughs> like, I, I, having, I've been wanting a vote for a long time. Having good friends or having the vote? You I don't care about my friends. I just wanted the vote. Like, I was, I'm cool with just like using everybody around me to get what I want. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, like, it means a lot to me that, 
you know, that we've done good enough work in, you know, in podcasting and writing and stuff like that. And we've worked on a couple of different networks with various people and they mm -hmm. thought enough of us to put in a good word for Dave. That means a lot. And it also means a lot that I get a vote this year because I, you know what, look, I'm not the greatest historian out there, but I do feel like I'm more qualified than some other people that got votes. So hell yeah. I definitely feel like I'm more qualified as a historian <laughs> than a lot of people who get votes. No, um, I've been writing about this since 2019. Like, so it's been a good five years. I've been doing stuff for, for various, you know, platforms and I feel, uh, you know, I'm definitely more of a podcaster now than a writer, but you know, I feel like we're, I feel like we're deserved. Like, I don't feel like this is crazy. My wife is like, no. not proud of me, but she's like very happy that I'm happy. You know, yeah. it was one of the, one of those things like, oh, good, <laughs> yeah. good, good for you. Yeah. Good, good for you, sweetie. <laughs> like, yeah. that's what it's kind of like, like when my wife comes home on Sunday and she goes, Hey, did the 49ers win? And I, and I just tell her all about the game and she's like texting her friends at the same time. Like she doesn't mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. And then she goes, Oh, that's great, honey. That's Congratulations. So your I'm your happy. football team won. I'm happy for you. Yeah. It's, that's, we are vacation <laughs> this weekend. That's what I got. I'm like, I got a vote in the hall of fame. She's like, what does that mean? I told her and she's like, Oh, is it going to cost us any money? I said, no. She's like, oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's a good great. question. That's, uh, that's a typical, a typical oh. wife question right there. Is it going to cost you money? Cause I, I know that you're like me. You spend some money on some pretty stupid shit stupid that involve shit. wrestling. Yes. Like, yeah. The, I don't even want to think about it over the years. The amount of dumb money I've spent on tickets. Mm -hmm. And like, did she, she, it was her idea to go to that indie Lucha show. I'll call it like last month. She's like, oh, we should take Andy to this little Lucha show in town. And I was like, oh, this will be lame. Yeah, we'll have fun. There was CML guys all over this little in the park show. I couldn't believe it. We had a blast. Yeah. It was her first 26 years we've been together, and I finally got her to go to a wrestling show. Yeah. Um, well, so the reason why we're here on a Sunday night, mm -hmm. and uh, if you're a Patreon subscriber, thank you. Um, if it. Also, if you're a Patreon subscriber and you want to, you, you, you think that somebody would like our stuff, but uh, they don't have the cash, uh, let me know because Patreon has different discount options out there for like month, like for like a month. Um, I did put out a promo code. So if you're already listening to this, it doesn't apply to you because you're already subscribers. But so if you know somebody that, that would like to jump on board and just give us a shot for a month for, for a single dollar, uh, just to shoot me a DM or email me right here on Patreon and let me know. And I can, uh, shoot you the info to send to them. Uh, but I did put out a promo code last night on Twitter and uh, somebody did take us up on that. So that was cool. So we had a free subscriber take us All up right. on that. So, uh, cause I've been putting a bunch of stuff on the free tier too, just articles and things like that. And so, uh, so thank you guys. Uh, we're trying to grow the brand here, trying to grow the Patreon and, uh, to keep this uh, ship going. But the, the reason why we're here on overtime is uh, JD was able to finally watch the six hour, docu-series uh mr mcmahon on netflix I, I told everybody my thoughts on the mike and jd show i did hold back a bit because i knew we were doing this but uh, what were your overall thoughts on the on the series i thought that it was well produced i thought the camera work was very slick i liked how i liked the aesthetic it was very gray it was very monotone gray in the background so i thought that was super interesting how they pulled that off um, I thought they had an interesting selection of um, subjects. I thought Dave Meltzer stole the show. Yeah. Uh, I thought he was far and away the best interview. I thought Cody Rhodes is the biggest worker I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. This the the guy that the guy that rallied people like we own pro wrestling. Like I heard that at the original All In back in 2018. Now he's like, oh, a sports entertainer, and I'm just the sport. The term of sports entertainment. It's like, my God, you have just no ethics whatsoever. So yeah. that was my thought. Um, on the whole, I will be honest with you and say I was bored to tears for the vast yeah. majority of this documentary. Um, I'm not the audience. Yeah. I, and, and you know what? And that doesn't surprise me that you're, you're a bit bored because they, they rehashed a lot of history that guys like you already knew about mm -hmm. and guys like me already knew about. And we had to relive certain eras that we didn't really like, we already re we've re relived them so many times in various documentaries, not only WWE produced ones, but you know, dark side of the ring had done all of these recently. I am so sick of the attitude era. It, I mean, like, I'm so glad that we've had a, such a microscope put on the attitude, the quote unquote attitude era to realize how bad it really was. 
like uh, the good news about all these documentaries that I've had to watch over the last decade plus about this is like, there's no stone unturned. Every memory I've ever had has been relived and I can look at it, not with rose colored glasses, but with a, with a stark sense of reality. And I can go, man, everything that wasn't Steve Austin or the rock was really bad. And even some Steve Austin and the rock was pretty bad too. Yeah, to agreed. So, and, and that's, and that was one. So I had many takeaways and we'll, we'll get into the takeaways from the documentary. Um, but some of the takeaways was, and I, and I felt this way during the, um, the, the, the Monday night war series on vice that I just didn't think was very good at all. Um, and for them to kind of re rehash some of that stuff was like kind of eye rolling. Uh, mm -hmm. but there were just so many different moments that I'm just like, that, that is my childhood. And what they were doing is absolutely disgusting. I loved every minute of it when I was a kid, but I look back on that with like kind of some, with a bit of shame that I enjoyed it so much. And I think Triple H said, well, who, who, is, who is worse, the people doing it or the people yelling and loving it? And I would say, I was a child, so I don't think I should be held accountable. But uh, my, my parents uh, sure did let me watch all that stuff. And not only that, they encouraged it, bought me T-shirts that said sucking on it. So they, they don't think they did a very good job. But uh, I, I would say a lot. there's a lot of bad people, but the, the WWF was mostly the worst. Mike, are you trying to tell me that Paul Levesque was refusing to take responsibility for something? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I think he kind of put the blame on the audience for loving it so much. Boy, I'm shocked to hear that. Um. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, and I felt I was a little older than you, so I would I watched it, but I kind of at the time was like, "This is stupid." Like a lot of the the massage. Like, I'm a weird. I was a weird guy, you know. I married my high school sweetheart, so I'm like, I, the misogyny and stuff like that. I didn't love it in the era, because again, I was I don't know. I'm just different like that. I guess some mean wuss or whatever you want to call me. So like, I didn't love that, but I mean, like, I sh I did enjoy the storylines at the time. Yeah. Like, and again, it was so cool. I think what I liked about it was like for a brief time in the attitude era, being a wrestling fan was cool again. Like mm -hmm. when I was in junior high and most of high school, I didn't tell anybody that I was watching wrestling until my senior year when it started getting cool, when everybody wanted to watch wrestling. I was like, yeah, I, I watch it all the time. I know. And I was, I became, oh yeah, that's JD. He knows all about that stuff. And then yeah. I wasn't a pariah anymore for that. So, I mean, like, I did enjoy <laughs> that aspect of stuff but i mean at the same time you go back and look at it it's like man, this is kind of terrible like and i hate when the, the, the the ruthless aggression like why do i have to watch john cena talking about why I, the ruthless aggression and i was there for that i was actually in the arena that was in chicago and he did oh really, really? Yeah, was, i saw a lot of they do a lot of cool stuff in chicago we're spoiled yeah. as fans but like i don't know did i have to watch that like did I need 45 minutes on Austin versus McMahon and two on Jimmy Snuka and Aunt Nancy Argentina? Yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. I understand why they would do that though. I, you know, but I, I, I went in, I, I went into the documentary, not thinking that they would even touch on hardly any of that stuff. And I was happy that they touched on damn near everything. And they left a couple of things out, but they actually touched a little bit on everything. No, here's where I disagree with you. I, why did they have to do that? Why did they have to spend a good chunk of it making Vince, uh, the WWE, and by proxy Vince McMahon, the underdog babyface? What was the purpose of that? I don't think they made them the underdog babyface. I well, think I they did a good job of calling bullshit on him do, being an underdog babyface. They do so call bullshit. He, he got the opportunity to say that he was the underdog babyface, but then they cut to people calling bullshit on it, which yeah. was the point of the documentary. But at the same time, they but we spent time establishing that. Did we need a whole episode? Uh, two episodes on from Montreal to the Attitude Era. Did we need that? Why? Could, like, and here's where I'll push back on this: is the the fact that it became the history of the WWE documentary that is not appealing to people that are outside the bubble. That is appealing to people on the outskirts of the bubble. Like, yeah. if, if our wives were going to watch this show, and I'm going to steal this take from from Joe because he was right about this. Yeah, I don't think they're interested in John Cena talking about ruthless aggression. I think they're far more interested in episode two and what Vin, the real, the only time you get to see the real Vince and what he was about was everything going on in episode two. That is where the interesting stuff was. But I think Bill Simmons buries all that in just history and like, you know, doing a history of the WWE documentary, which is, there's a bazillion of those. And I think they do a disservice to their audience by focusing on that rather than because it's two and six are the only times you get a look at like what I think normal people would be interested in. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think, um, I think the Netflix audience with all the documentaries that they have on there, I think they would be pretty intrigued by the more salacious stuff. I agree um, with that. Yeah. I, I, I understand why they went with the history of wrestling part of it, because I think that's what the documentary was about. Like it was about Vince McMahon. I think that was the point of the documentary. It was like, Hey, we're going to tell the history of, of Vince McMahon while we're doing it. We have to, t well, they felt that they had to tell the history of the WWE because the two are synonymous. Um, so I kind of got that. I, I wasn't clock watching on, on the different scandals. Cause there's just, I think they could do a whole s series on just the scandals and probably do a much better job than what vice does um but i don't think they'll ever get the i don't think they'll ever get access to the footage again i don't think that um that they'll ever be able to do anything like this again so it's kind of like you know every, and i think joe and, and rich hit on this and i'm pretty sure dave hit on this and, and bill simmons even hit on this he's like hey we, this was the goal of of the docuseries was to tell the the, the story of vince mcmahon we were going to try to touch on on the, on the other stuff we would tell the, the history of the wwe at the same time and then these other stories just kept popping up and then we kept digging and digging and digging and pulling back the layers of the onion. Um, and so it just, the whole thing became a mess. I, I thought they, they did a good job with, with the, the issues that they were facing. And I thought in episode six, they ended it in episode six where Vince McMahon, I don't think he could have looked any worse or Bruce Pritchard or the WWE. I agree with that. Now here, but here's again, they're like, Oh, Bill's like, Oh, it could have been 10 episodes. It could have been three. It could have been three. Like, in reality, the the traditional audience doesn't care about the history of pro wrestling, or else they would be pro wrestling fans. That's my that is, and this is where I this is where I, I differ with a lot of people. Is and I know I humble brag. I've done this. Yeah, I've done this. I know what happens when a story takes on a life that you didn't see, and the answer is you chase the story. And I don't think they did that. I think that they were more interested in playing paint by numbers because they had something and they could have sat on it and they could have gone to make something more salacious or just to be quite frank, more interesting. And they chose not to like, you could have had a whole episode on the steroid thing. You could have had a whole episode on the ring boy thing. You could have had a whole episode on Rita Chatterton. Instead, they pushed it all into one. Like, it was like, we're going to get all this scandal stuff out. But look how awesome Vince and WWE. Yeah, he lies a lot. But I mean, like, it was far more of a glorification. And then all of a sudden, you got to throw Dave in there calling out their bullshit. Yeah. But it was like, they, okay, it's like, okay, it's like, Vince is awesome. Vince is awesome. Vince is awesome. Vince is awesome. Vince is full of shit. Vince is awesome. Vince is awesome. Vince is awesome. Vince is full of shit. <laughs> yeah. the, like, the, people, the people that kept calling him awesome were the ones that kept getting bullshit called on him. And that's, that's I really like that part of it because I I've never... Too. I, I never, you never see that in any type of now WWE removed their affiliation from it. Um, they allowed the footage to go through, um, but you just never see that in any, like you, you've never seen anything like this with, uh, with their footage being licensed and giving, getting this much access with oh, these people I, being able uh, to say uh, bullshit that, on that ain't, that ain't true. My man, we saw behind the mat, which was plenty of that. Vince didn't like it. And we, oh, also, yeah. saw, we since, also saw wrestling with shadows. Which is yeah, still since since wrestling. yeah since since those uh, since since those two documentaries, um, and with and I I I I see all of your points. They could have just made a more like a true crime documentary uh, as opposed to a history of wrestling and a history of Vince McMahon documentary, but that's just the way they went with it. Well, and that's the thing too is like, and again, this is the degree in media messaging. Like, you have ten positive to one negative. What what's going to stick out? You know, yeah, well, yes, it, you pay, you pay it depends mind on what the to, negative is. It depends on the negative, but I mean, I think yeah. I do think the vast majority of people up till episode six, if you make it past God, if you can make it to episode six, I do think that you you think that Vince is full of shit, but he's super successful and did good for wrestling. The best line in the whole thing, which I know you're gonna talk about to me, is, which the one you said yeah, I want to hear your reaction to, is when they ask Vince about WrestleMania, right? Yeah. When he says WrestleMania was good for it wasn't good for the industry, but it was good for my business. And that's what I care about. Yeah. I was like, yeah. that's the line. There's another one I thought you meant too, where, where, uh, where they call Vince out on his bullshit about Ted Turner. Mm -hmm. it's like he's poaching it. Well, and he kills strip says, if I do it, it's fine. If it's done to me, I don't like it. <laughs> how I yeah. think and how I feel are two different things. Yeah. And, and, and Bischoff did a good job calling bullshit on, on that. And I didn't think that he would. And I was happy that he did. And exactly. so, and I, I understand the, the pushback on the length. 
I understand the pushback on retelling the history of it. Um, it didn't bother me, but I get why it bothered other people. I thought they did a good job making Vince out to be a full of shit rapist monster by the end of it. Right. Which I think was, look, I know not everybody's going to get everything that they want in these things. I, I know, I know a couple of people that wanted a complete bloodbath and they didn't get that. Um, yeah, I, 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 I get that. I know, I know some people, I know at least one person that, that wanted it to be what it, what it was, but without the salacious details, they wanted to celebrate their fandom of WWE and Vince McMahon, right? There, there's those people out there too, right? Which is why Bruce Pritchard was so upset in episode six, whenever, whenever he had seen it, he's like, you guys just ripped Vince to shreds. Cause I feel like they did. I mm-hmm. feel like they did. And I, I compared this one to OJ made in America, the ESPN documentary that I love. I, I thought, I thought that one, I, I thought they're pretty similar the way they did it. They told the history of OJ Simpson in chronological order. And then what did they end it with? They, they, they did 10 positives to one negative or to probably three negatives because, because he also, he had issues in UCLA, but they kind of talked about how he's this great football player, one of the all-time greats. He's actually a great announcer, did all these great commercials, was in the Naked Gun series, but oh yeah, he is a, he is a serial abuser, and then he murdered his wife. Here's the difference with that, though, is that Vi- O.J. Simpson is O.J. Simpson, right? Vince McMahon, I think a lot of normal people don't really know the full extent to what Vince McMahon is. Yeah, And I think that Vince McMahon most people think he's just a carnival huckster wrestling guy. Right. But I don't think a lot of people realize just how filthy he is. Right. I and that's they how, do now. If they I think they do. Yeah. But at the same yeah. time, like everything was like, everything was squeezed into episode two. There's so much bad baggage that this man brought with him and they jammed it into one, into two, epi- into one episode, but I had to get two fucking episodes about how great WWE was. And ah, two now so awesome. And ruthless aggression and all this stupid fucking shit that only, uh, only appeals to wrestling fans. A normal person doesn't give a flying fuck about ruthless aggression. A wrestling fan, a non-wrestling fan doesn't care about, you know, Montreal. Like they don't like that's a that's a there's been that is subject has been scrutinized better more times. And I just I think that they lost the plot. I really do. I think they whereas OJ made it America because the heinousness of those crimes and how well known it was, there's a dark undercurrent to the entire documentary. Like there's a shadow that hangs over every scene of it. That's not present in this one. Like it just isn't, it just isn't, it doesn't feel nearly as dangerous. Like large chunks of it, not the whole thing, but there are chunks of it where they try to do, they're a little more WWE propaganda then I would be comfortable. Now they do call bullshit on it, but it's the vast majority of it is not bullshit. The vast majority of it is them flinging the bullshit at you. Well, and then the bullshit gets called out. But at the same the, time, the vast like, majority of it is what happened on television. Correct. <laughs> like, yeah. Correct. <laughs> yeah. And that's, so it's, it's, it's not exactly bullshit. It's like the stuff did happen. They're just like retelling it. And that's the, and that's, the, and that's where I take my issue with it is that like six episodes. I don't, I mean, I don't, I think they wasted their time with, silliness like i did like the episode three where they start with the spider lady screw job and they book in it with montreal i'm like okay you know it's actually okay kind of cool that's bullshit too that's a hundred percent a bullshit story wendy richter was offered a new contract and wanted wanted an agent to look at <laughs> yeah. it that's why she got fucked over and if you watch the thing it clearly i mean like it's they're working yeah. The post-match fight isn't Brett having a fit. It's a work. And you just steer into the fucking work. And nobody called bullshit on that one. So I was a little, eh. So it, it's, yeah. It's a little too pro wrestling. I wonder, I wonder if they even asked Dave about the Wendy Richter one. Because um, that's that screw job isn't like, you and I know about that screw job. I don't think anybody else knows about that. I think everybody that's ever been a wrestling fan knows about the Montreal screw job. I mean, everybody over the age of like 20 right. you know, would, would, would know about that one. But I would say that most, most people probably don't really don't really know but i think the, they use that to set the table for oh, and, yeah. what was to come to, because ultimately the screw job was the impetus to create the mr mcmahon character and they were kind of like like here's vince the person here, here's vince mcmahon the character now we got to decipher who the person is versus the character and the truth is is they're one and the same and i think that's what they ultimately got at but we had to take two episodes to figure that out 
Well, yeah. Well, and then they're also telling this, the history of WWE. I agree. We didn't need ruthless aggression. We certainly didn't need Brock Lesnar beating Undertaker at WrestleMania. Yeah, what like, was I that? Well, th that was so much time on. I was just like, why? <laughs> like, I was like, why are we? Why are we doing this? But I think it was because um, I think they just thought that was a huge moment in wrestling history. I, I, I legitimately think that, and I think that John Cena becoming a, a superstar. Brock Lesnar defeating Undertaker was a huge moment. And then, of course, they, they parlayed that into the Roman Reigns era. And they sped that up. And then the, the final episode is uh, everything that you just watched doesn't mean shit because this guy's an evil guy. And that's what I'm saying. It's like nobody, a normal person watching it doesn't give a shit about the Undertaker streak. In a, this is why wrestling's so stupid. Like, he was undefeated at WrestleMania for 13 years, or whatever. Like, it's a work, man. <laughs> It's a fucking work. Like, what do you people, think about uh, oh, what do you think about Vince's line about uh, he didn't think Undertaker was concussed. He just had a blackout moment because he didn't want to lose. <laughs> here's what I, here's what I think. I think Vince believes that. Yeah, I do. I, think, I do too. I think, I think he's such a worker himself. I mean, how can you not when you how can you not be a jaded person having to run a professional wrestling promotion your entire adult life? Like, yeah. and they, you're working with like, these people are liars. This is one thing that this documentary teach you is that never trust a single thing that comes out of the mouth of anyone who is a professional wrestler at any point ever. They lie constantly. Mm -hmm. They can't, they can't help but lie. They don't even know. They don't even know. They're so into the lie that they don't even know the truth anymore. It's like Costanza. It's not a lie. If you believe in it, yeah. right? And I think that yeah. Vince thinks that like, it's just, I don't know, man. Like it's just, it was so <laughs> unimportant. Like the undertaker streak came to an end. Are you, are you, I, every time I hear a wrestling fan talk like this, I want to be like, do you have balls? Like, are you a rational human being? The fact that you're crying over a worked match. Come on, dude. Like I, <laughs> I, I feel that way every time I see somebody on Twitter using cry face emojis over something like, like over anything oh, like uh, it, it's it really is the worst. Uh, I can't remember what it was recently. Somebody did cry face emoji about just somebody appearing on AEW. And I was like, I just replied to them like, why are you crying? <laughs> just like, like, why would why would a grown adult? I assume you're an adult. Why would you use a cry face emoji over somebody showing up to work? Yeah, exactly. Like. I can get moved by fiction, right? I've read books yeah. that have like knocked the wind out of me. I've seen films that have just taken, taken it out of me emotionally. And like, I really felt it. Like I'm an emotional dude. I'll be the first to admit it. I have never cried in a professional wrestling match in my entire life. Like nothing yeah. has ever, like I've been excited. I love doing, I love watching it. I just, I can't fathom crying. I never, I, can't. I never cried during a match. But when Owen died and they did the raw tribute the night after, different fucking Total, dude totally. wrecked me. And the same thing when Eddie died Eddie, and they did Eddie said. because I had just seen him at SmackDown in Fresno with my best friend. We went and watched it together, and then like a year later, the dude's dead. It, it fucked me up. Here's a confession. I don't know if I've ever told anybody this. Um, I cried at the Benoit one because we by the time that show had ended we knew the truth and they yeah. put together this this video to finger 11's one thing mm -hmm. that knocked the wind out of me completely S same because we knew the truth by the time that that mm -hmm. aired and i saw this these videos of this father loving his son who murdered him and yeah. the choice of song like it just it, it was it, i i couldn't watch wrestling for a few years after that dude that that one that one screwed me up too. I saw Benoit like two weeks before he died in Rolla, Missouri, in the main event, and and it was like a thousand people there. It was like a small like sea town there. Like Rolla, Missouri is like halfway in between Springfield and St. Louis, so it's like mm -hmm. super small town. It was at that a, college there. I had, a, I had a buddy who played college football there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we we saw him, and I was living in Japan at the time. I went home to go visit family to see my cousin graduate from high school. So I flew home, saw him graduate, went to a wrestling show, flew back. And then like a week later he had died and the, the, the shit happened. And then we got, when we got it in Japan on the um, armed forces network. So 
we didn't get it until like a day later because they would send us the tape for free. So we would watch it. It was Tuesday night raw where we're at because we're like, you know, whatever, 13 hours ahead. Mm -hmm. And so then it would get like on an eight hour delay. So I had already knew everything at that point. By the time I'd watched Monday night raw, they didn't pull the tape. So all of us in Japan that were watching it. And I assume there was quite a few people on base that were still, because it was pretty popular at the time um watching it we knew everything like it was all like well, i'm watching like nancy grace an hour before raw comes on the armed forces network and i gotta watch that that fucking took me out did i ever tell you about the time i met chris benoit no okay so summer of 2001 uh leading into this i i had herniated two discs in my neck in college my sophomore year of college wrestling um my arm i was in a match i was actually in a match and my arm went dead and it was really weird and I, I'm riding legs and you can see my arm kind of dangling and then it feels okay. And I'm like, that was really weird. So I, I kept wrestling through it. I kept wrestling through it. And, um, uh, after Thanksgiving, I lost 16 pounds in 18 hours to make weight. I wasn't supposed to wrestle. I, I dropped a shit ton of weight. And I won. I was great. The next day in practice, I threw an underhook and my arm went numb and this time it didn't come back. So like, and it was days. I, I didn't tell anybody cause I didn't want to lose my spot, but I was wrestling bad in the room cause I couldn't move my arm. And uh, I had a match. I had to meet and I got my ass kicked and I was out dinner with my dad and I was bawling. Cause I'm like, I could not like emotional up and down. This was the same week that I cut all the weight. I went from the hero to the goat. Like, and I, people yeah. were like, like I, my college coach was like super disappointed in me. Like it was wild. And um, so I went to the doctor, turned out I had two hernia discs in my neck and they wanted to fuse my neck together. And my trainer, I was like, let's do it. I'll be back by Midlands. So I'll be back six weeks. No problem. They're like, Oh no, you'll be done. And I was like, holy shit. And then uh, our trainer's like, you're 20. You're not doing that. Like, we're just going to rehab you. So I did. I spent six months in physical therapy, moved up in weight class, really muscled up, changed the way I wrestled. And that was the same year that Chris Benoit hurt his neck in the ladder match with Jericho. And I think it was Triple H and Steve Austin or something like that, where he blew his neck out. And he did get the fusion surgery. Yeah. So that summer, he was doing a tour for WWE because he was hurt. And he was at the Bally's in my hometown. So my brother and I were like, let's go meet Chris Benoit because we were huge wrestling fans. So we went to, uh, I went to this taco place and had these two big ass ques um, quesadillas before I knew I had celiac disease, which is the, the funny <laughs> part of the story. So we're in line to meet Chris Benoit. And uh, have you ever misinterpreted a fart? Oh yeah. Shart. Yeah. That's what happened. Oh, yeah. I, I let a fart go next in line. I looked at my, I was like, yeah. I looked at my brother and said, <laughs> I have to go to the bathroom right now. And he's like, are you okay? I'm like, we'll talk soon. And I went to the, I'm like, I shit my pants. And I'd never done that before. I'm like, I can't believe this happened to me. So I got, I got rid of my underwear, cleaned my ass in the bathroom <laughs> and went back in line to meet Chris Benoit. And like, I met, there's a picture of me and my brother and Chris Benoit where I have no underwear on, but I'm on, I don't tell nobody that. <laughs> so like, this was years earlier. And I was jokingly, in, cause I don't know how to process that. Cause he was my favorite wrestler. And I was going to talk to him too. I was like, I had this big thing. I was going to talk to him like, Hey man, I had the same injury as you, but I didn't fuse my neck here. And I had like these, I, in my head, I scripted this out while I was going to have this conversation and this connection moment with Chris Benoit. And, uh, I said, Hey man, I, I heard he had two discs in my neck and da da da. He's like, do they have the surgery? I said, no, they just rehabbed me. I said, I was too young. He like, goes, you don't want the surgery. It fucking sucks. Sign my <laughs> thing. And that was it. And I was like, it. Oh, okay. Let's get our picture. Yeah. So I like, so preface, funny. I was like, perhaps at the time I met a serial killer and shit my pants. <laughs> yeah. All right. So since you told the shit your pants story, now I got to. Oh, yeah. Now we're going back. Since you started, we're doing that. Yeah, now we're telling war stories. Yeah. Let's do it. So in Missouri, uh, before I had joined the military, I didn't start drinking until I was 20. I, I had never had a, a sip of alcohol. I had sips, but I never got drunk until I, I was like 20. It was actually well, yeah, I, I just didn't I just didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm, well, but once once I started drinking, I was like, fuck, this is what I'm doing now. Like is it like the moment it's like just it's like Frank the Tank, the moment it hits your lips, like that was me, right? Um, so we're 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 out and about and we're drinking, and I think I was popping pills at the same time, just mm -hmm. totally bad. And we're eating Taco Bell and this and that. We're out and about and we're going creaking. You ever got gone like no, back I, road I, I, and going no. going to creeks? Creaking? So we, we would do just drive down back roads listening to music like Hootie and the Blowfish and just like fucking whatever. Eve six inside out, like just screaming at the top of our lungs. So we go down in the back roads and we just go out to creeks, right? And just, just fuck off and drink beers and do all that stuff. So, but we get out there and no toilet to be seen. And I, and I got to go, but I'm, I'm like high and drunk at the same time. Right. So I go and I just pull my pants down in the woods 
and I shit into my pants oh, because God. I'm just so fucked up. <laughs> so I just, I'm just shitting and I just shit into my pants. And I, and I looked, I looked down and I was like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know i had to do the whole thing i had to like uh you know toss the underwear out and then like i had to put the pants in the creek and wash them out and then i had it because like I, I can't get in the back of my buddy's truck butt naked so i'd mm-hmm. like <laughs> so just wear wet pants you know clean them out but yeah <laughs> Dude, I've had that. And, oh. uh, that's so funny it's such a humbling there's no more a humbling moment for an adult man than to poop your pants in public and have to just live with the fact that you just shit yourself. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's the worst. It's, it's legit. The worst. It is legit. But the worst. Speaking of shit. Uh, let's get back to the documentary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's so funny because I, I'm just a fan of history documentaries. And so even I if they too. tell me stuff that I already know, it, do, it doesn't bother me. But I think if, if your goal going into it and I know, and I know BJ was not happy with this thing. Cause I think he wanted it to be, kind of more of the true crime type of stuff. Mm-hmm. But I got that they were trying to weave true crime in with the history stuff. And I, and I, I thought they, the way they ended it, uh, I felt like the goal was reached, at least from my expectation, the goal was reached because by the end of that thing, you did not have a high opinion of Vince no. McMahon. You had a way worse opinion of him. If you didn't know much about him, you only knew him as like the funny guy on TV. Um, and, and you were kind of like a little bit of a wrestling fan from when you were a kid and you probably hadn't watched it in a while, but now that it's on Netflix, you're, you're picking it back up again. Like, I think that you would go in, there's like, he's probably the most horrible human being that, that was like, you've ever seen on television, right? He'd be like up there with all the different monsters. I feel like that's the way they ended it. That's kind of what you would get at. Even David Shoemaker said, this guy's probably like a really terrible human being. Um, And we've just been seeing him on TV for all these years. Right. So uh, I, so I did think they ended it that, that way. I think in episode six, Bruce Pritchard couldn't have looked any worse. <laughs> so now I, he's going to get a little bit of an out because he was saying all those nice things about Vince two days before the Janelle Grant stuff came out. Um, and you would probably assume that maybe Vince has a mental stranglehold over him, just like he has one over the undertaker and several other people that have ever worked for him. Mm-hmm. They all have this string. He has a stranglehold on him where they all right, look up to him and they think that he's infallible. Mm-hmm. Right. As far as, and I get the feeling that they believe he didn't do anything wrong uh, with, with some of those people. Um, and I, Bruce Pritchard might be one of those people, but I would, if I were WWE after this thing came out and how bad he looked, I would take a hard look at whether or not he needs to be in that company anymore. I would say something about triple H. We had a friend again, we have our friend that, uh, we know we don't like to out him. He posed a question to us in our text chain about, do you think Shane McMahon was the one who dropped the dime on the wall street journal? I don't, I think it was Stephanie. And I think, I think, I think in episode six, they kind of hinted at it, to be honest with yeah, you. I thought so and, too. And because, you know, at one point, you know, one guy that I didn't think was any good in this documentary, by the way, I, I, he, I got more annoyed by him than anybody else. in was Paul Heyman with his just over the top delivery on these fucking stories. And especially the story that he told about being at dinner with Vince and Shane and Vince handing Shane a knife and saying, if you want this company, you got to stab me in the heart. Um, I think, I think he wanted Shane to do it literally. And I think Stephanie McMahon did it like, you know, in a different way, a bloodless coup, I think is what she did. I, th- that's always been kind of what we've speculated on. Cause she was out and then that happened and then she was back in. Right. It was very, uh, it's very, yeah, there was something, I, I definitely agree with that. I don't, Shane seems to be the one who always strives for dad's approval and never gets it. Yeah. Whereas Stephanie had the approval and like my brother and I have that same relationship. We had that same relationship with my dad where we were, we were, we've been digging through a lot of shit with, uh, you know, grieving this year with him where like I was the oldest and I was like the one who always sought that approval from my dad and like rarely got it. Cause he wasn't like very good at expressing his emotions where my brother was always like, fuck him. I don't need him thinking anything about me. You know, like it was yeah. always, so I kind of, I, I kind of got a little bit of those vibes from that and i could totally see i could totally see what you mean i thought those interesting texts we got from our friend because i didn't think i don't think that shane has that in him uh well he tried it he tried it at one point that's why they fired that's why they told him to get out of the company but he didn't do it i don't think he did it like the way that stephanie did by leaking the media like that's not yeah i mean she went for the kill he just kind of he didn't commit to it you know yeah 
You know, it's so so funny. I, I was watching uh, News Nation a, a little while ago, and it was at the time when uh, when the Democrats were trying to get rid of Biden, right? Mm-hmm. And they, uh, Chris Chris Cuomo, who does a pretty good show on there, he had a Democratic donor on, a, uh, a multimillionaire guy who I think he owns a furniture store or something like that. He's kind of like a mattress Mac type of guy, but he he donates millions of dollars every year to the Democratic Party and to certain campaigns. So he brought he brought him on. He had knew, known him. I think he probably donated to his brother's campaign in New York. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he said the greatest line when he was talking about Nancy Pelosi, uh, and he said the Democratic Party needs a shark, right? And everybody wants to be a shark until it's time to do some shark shit. And Nancy Pelosi is the only one willing to get blood on her face. And I think that was Stephanie McMahon. I think Shane McMahon tried to do the coup, but he didn't He didn't want to be a shark when he did it. I think he tried to do it in a professional manner. And Stephanie was like, look, I got to get rid of this guy because he's going to tank the company. We're going to try to salvage this thing because they were going in the wrong direction, direction were- despite the fact that they were making record profits based off of their TV deals. Mm-hmm. Uh, business was actually declining. Ratings were declining rapidly. The ticket sales were declining. All those things were going in the wrong direction. And who knows if they would have got this Netflix deal if he had stayed in the company that kept going down this path, right? And so I, I think she did some shark shit. I think she was like, fuck it. We're just going to leak this to a board member. Or it might have been her. I got contacts with the Wall Street Journal. She knows all those people in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, she she ran that company for a while. Mm-hmm. Or ran that side of the operation anyway and just went for it. I would I would agree with you. That's a great clown. I, I'm going to start watching watching you and Mel talk about News Nations. Made me actually super curious to start watching it. So you've me have you've made me a uh, a super News Nation curiosity seeker. Uh, I love that line about Nancy Pelosi because that is an accurate statement about Democrats in general. <laughs> yeah, 100. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I think I don't think Shane. I think he might just be too nice of a guy. You know, yeah, and Shane's Shane's the one that everybody likes. That's and what I'm there's saying. a reason yeah. for that, and yeah, and I think that's what you know, and that's what Tony Atlas, who I I thought was really great in he the was, in the he show, he told like, my Pekka. I, yeah, he, 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 he tried to grab my Pekka. I was like, <laughs> I I oh dude, I gotta tell another funny story about Packer. Oh, so, oh, go for well, it. Yeah, well, it's not it's not what you think. Oh, so God. we we had this chicken in our yard and it was like laying eggs I actually laid eggs in my daughter's stroller like in the basket underneath <laughs> and so my daughter was actually going out there and feeding the chicken and taking care of the chicken and and we had it we had to put it to the side so nobody could see it because you're not allowed to have chickens in the neighborhood they just run free is We'd this in hawaii free. it's hawaii yeah free range chickens out here so but you can't like feed you're not supposed to feed them you're not supposed to take care of them because then more will come and they bring diseases and all that stuff so they don't want too many in the neighborhood and if they get too many they rehome them I think they eat them, but they tell us they rehome them. But okay. So we're she was feeding it. And my wife goes, Well, what's your chicken's name? And sure enough, she calls the chicken Pecker. And I was like, I was like, Ashley, we, we gotta tell her that, that chicken can't be called Pecker. Because she's gonna go w- walking around the neighborhood talking about Pecker, this, Pecker, that. Like, we can't have that. I she's gonna go to she's gonna go to preschool talking about Pecker. I was like, No, we can't do it. And so we had to say, honey, that's a bad word. And then she started crying because she felt like she did something wrong. I was like, no, you didn't do anything wrong. It's just the name. You can't use it. Well, what's the name mean? I was like, well, don't tell her that either. <laughs> oh, see, I would have straight up told Andy what it means. And he would have been laughing his ass off about it. Yeah. He might, oh, she might have made it worse. He might have actually steered into the skin at that point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. Parenting, <laughs> so, man. So, that's a good story. Yeah. Yeah. So funny. Um, so, but yeah, Tony so, Atlas is great. Shane. Yeah. This too probably too nice a guy yeah. to be in this, you know. Yeah, Vince yeah. not a nice guy. No. Here's what's interesting. Did you know? I re- last year I read the Abe Oh Reisman. I think is his name. Jo- Joseph Abraham Josephine Reisman. Uh, That's what it is. Uh, female. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I read their book, and uh, shockingly enough, it's a more sympathetic portrayal of Vince McMahon because they go into in his, excuse me, in their book, they go into Vince's childhood and they really unearth a lot of the traumas that Vince had where he was sexually assaulted in a movie theater by some older girls when he was like 10. Yeah. And they also talk about, a. this is from his, uh, excuse me, this is from their book. So I'm not unearthing something, but they allege that Vince might have had an inappropriate relationship with his mother. I think at one point during the documentary, 
Vince did bring up the word incest. He said abuse and he said incest. Yeah. And then later they talk about the storyline between him and Stephanie. Yes. And I thought that was fucking weird. Right. And like the storyline itself is weird. It's weird. Yeah. But, if, but then if you know about the history, if you know a little bit about the history, no, they didn't explore it um, in the documentary, oh, but he did yeah. say the word incest, I believe. And no. so I was like, I think he's talking about his mom and, and there being some incest there. So, um, and, and then for him to present that storyline with Stephanie, uh, I don't, I'm not going to speculate anything, but, um, it, it makes more sense to me why Stephanie would be the one to, to stab him in the heart than huh. Shane there. So oftentimes when we're creating, right, when you're a creative person, you're working through your traumas, you're working through your baggage in your art, right? So I can sympathize with that. And like I said, in this book that I read, they talk about how Vince didn't grow. Vince grew up in North Carolina, with his mother and his stepfather. Vince grew up Vinnie Lupton, which they don't even say that in this documentary. Yeah. He didn't become Vince McMahon until he moved in with his dad after high school. Right. Like he was Vinnie Lupton up till then. He's a Carolina hillbilly kid, which is funny. Um, he was abused, physically abused by his stepfather. And pretty much they insinuate sexually abused by his mother. And like, I think the documentary does a better job of, or excuse me, the book does a better job of establishing the why this guy is a monster, you know? And I don't want saying like you have to have sympathy for the devil. Cause I mean, I think that weakens the devil in some cases, but I yeah. think, I think here having that extra bit of knowledge, it kind of does a better job painting the picture of why, like, and, and I think it makes, I think it makes you more apt to believe a lot of the effed up stuff he did because like you kind of get a clear vision of what this guy really <clears> is <throat> and how it warped his sense of, of morality and reality truly is. Cause when you watch WWE program, it's specifically from the attitude era, you can kind of get the unvarnished real Vince McMahon. And a lot of it is filtered through the eyes of Vince Russo, another messed up individual. Yeah. But like, yeah. there's a lot, like you said, specifically the Stephanie storyline, like there's a lot of like the Katie Vick stuff. Like a lot of that was Vince pushing, the envelope to get him to do yeah you gotta get on that neck that dead body and go you know it's a fucked up individual and yeah like i'm not saying you should have sympathy for him at all like no. i can't stand the man I, but i do think that it would have done a better service to this documentary and i think that having that information early on helps paint a better picture of the man that we know him to become it could have been something that they weren't able to verify possible some of the information, but they had Vince saying the word abuse. And I believe somebody could fact check me on this, but I believe he did say the word incest. Maybe I'll have to go back and rewatch episode one, but I did remember him saying that now he didn't say incest by who I don't, I don't yeah. know that it was the the mom. I don't think they said that in the documentary, but Reisman definitely says that in the book. I would have interviewed uh, at least at least alleges, at least alleges that maybe they were like, I don't think there's enough for us to go on. So they just didn't go with it. And well, they also had the support of Vince at the time when they started this thing. So, yeah. and he even says like, there's, I'm not going to tell you guys the truth. Vince, like they have Vince on camera saying, I'm not going to tell you guys everything. You know, yeah. he's a surprisingly yeah. guarded guy for a guy who's not very guarded, you know, isn't it a weird thing <laughs> yeah. to say, but it's yeah. kind of true. Like, again, that's the wrestling thing. You're, you're, you're in constant work mode. So one thing that we didn't get into on Thursday that I, I thought was hilarious um, and Twitter was pretty upset at me, which is pretty normal. Shocking and, to hear and that. Dave, Dave Meltzer, I was on his radar. He quote tweeted it. Um, so the, oh, the line in the first, the line in the first movie and the first episode where Linda McMahon talked about how they were able to buy the company or Vince senior essentially gave it to them yep. and they paid it back with profits from the gates Yep. O over the course of time. They said they were robbing Peter to pay Paul. Yep. And, love that. and I, I love that, but I, I knew that already. Right. Mm -hmm. Like David told the story. It had been out there for a long time, but they never said that the story, they always said that they bought the, the company from the dad. Now, technically they did buy it, but they, it was, they were essentially gifted it. And the previous owner just got to keep the profits for a little while. Right mm -hmm. now that is still a business transaction, but it's not the picture that people paint of Vince McMahon and his purchase of the territory all these years later. Oh no, it's much closer to what Tony Khan did, which, which the WWE ites are, are very anti, you know, yeah. they like have this, again, this is Vince's crafted 
interpretation of his own background. Like they love to say, oh, Vince just bought the company from his dad and dad and they interest free loan that he could pay back whenever. Like, you know, yeah. so I liked I did like that they said it. I, I forgot about that. That's a great call, Mike. I do yeah. like that they that the truth was finally exposed by Linda McMahon of all people. What did you say yeah. on Twitter that pissed people off? I missed this. I, I said I, I said that essentially I said it's pretty funny that they said this and it kind of ruins the perception of WWE fans. It's probably going to piss them off. Um, and uh, I got a lot of people in my replies, like that's just a smart business thing. Why do you think that's not a good thing? It's like, no, it is a good thing. Like that is a smart business thing, but it's not anything that he like earned, right? Like he didn't start a business and then get, or he didn't even go get a loan to, to buy this thing off and have to pay the loan down over years. He just got the hand, the company handed to him while his dad was still working there and then just gave him the profits for a little bit to him and all his partners. And that's all that happened. And it was a smart thing to do. He, he had the vision for it. He was a great businessman. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing, there was nothing nefarious going on there, but it wasn't what they made it out to be. It's not, I mean, like when you look at how Croc, how Jim Crockett took over the territory, his old, old man, Jim senior passed away. The brother-in-law was going to run it and he did a shit job. And then Jimmy junior had to, had to pick up the pieces for the family and wound up making the company super profitable. Like, yeah. That's a more honorable story than what really, I mean, like he did, he yeah. got a gift from his dad and there's nothing it, wrong with that. There's nothing but like, wrong. Yeah. No, but here's, here's the, the problem is that like that is portrayed as a negative when it's the guy who happens to be half Pakistani, but it's a great thing when it happens to be the rich kid from New York. Well, I, I well, honestly I'll tell think, you about how you spend the story. Yeah. Well, no, I, I honestly think they're probably going to go back on what they think of what they're saying, what they've always been saying about Tony, Klon, Tony Khan getting, ha getting, ha having his dad purchase a company for him. Now that they know this information about Vince, because it was the most profitable territory that there was, it was the most successful territory, had all the biggest towns, Baltimore, New York city, Philadelphia, Philadelphia Boston, Pittsburgh, Boston. Yeah. Look at the and, territory, and, man. Yeah. They had all the biggest, they had, they had the biggest money, they, they had the biggest crowds. They were the mm -hmm. most successful territory and he got it handed to him because his dad was ready to get out and, and he took it over and he made it bigger than anybody could have ever imagined. Right. Those things are all true, but the origin story isn't what people think. They think, Oh, he was the self-made man. It's like, no, he got handed the most successful wrestling company in the world. Mm -hmm. that, that's, it. And that's it. That's it. That's it. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. However, what you believe about him is not true. Like, no, you could compare it. Like, I'm a, I hate to get political on this show, but I am for a second. Like, Donald Trump is the same thing. Donald Trump inherited his father's company, but we've seen how many times that he went bankrupt and how he actually would have made more money if he just put the money in the bank and left it alone. Yeah. And how he actually has invert because of his biz. Like, say what you want about Vince McMahon and Donald Trump. Vince McMahon is a far better businessman than Donald Trump ever was. That's just the honest to God truth. Like, as far as taking what you do and becoming successful at it and keeping the money that you made. Right. Vince had a fairly upward trajectory for the most part of his business. Right. That ain't the case with the other guy. Yeah. You know, but again, it's it's the story that we present that surrounds it. It's the propaganda that we build yeah. around these things. Like they, they become iconoclasts in a sense. Well, Vince has only ran one successful business and it was the WWE. That's also true. But yeah. it's but he was really good at it. Now, again, what I hate is people like Vince wrestling would be gone if it wasn't for Vince McMahon. And it's no. like why would you say that? Like, that's just Re no. wrestling. Wrestling was stronger before he took the, he took over. He killed wrestling and made it into a one company place because there were so many th territories all over the world. I'm all over the world. I'm not talking about the U S all over the world. And his takeover killed those territories. They were thriving, selling thousands of tickets a week. And he took all the top talent, killed their territories. And now you can't get thousands of people a week in the same territory unless you're in Tokyo or Mexico city. And that's it. You know how you know that's true? Because Vince McMahon told you that in his documentary. Yeah. Yeah. That Vince, Vince says that Vince says it himself. Memphis used to draw thousands of people a week every Monday at the Mid-South Coliseum. You can't do that anymore anywhere. You can't do that anymore. No. Like other, other, than, other than Mexico City and Tokyo. That's City it. And Tokyo. Yeah. In yeah. Tokyo, they just have tons of wrestling shows everywhere across the city. Tokyo is just different. Like, that's the truth. Vince McMahon, in a lot of ways, he what he did helped WWF and WWE and crush pro wrestling. But yeah. people don't want to admit that. Like wrestling was was super super strong in the eighties. The boom of wrestling didn't start with WWE. They just the yeah. ones that reap the benefits of it. Like wrestling just got hot in the early eighties because of cable TV. Yeah, yeah, and and 
they they are the ones that capitalized on it. They did it. The, mm-hmm. They did it the best, you know, as far as promoting and things like that. Promoting. And uh, and they ended up the most successful. Now, if Vince didn't expand, I think other companies were already <laughs> already trying. They just didn't have oh. the vision that he had. Oh, 100 you know I mean? percent. Only was yeah. trying, didn't have the vision. Uh, you know, Fritz kind of dabbled in it, didn't have the vision. Vern was, Vern was yeah. trying. He didn't have the vision. Now here's what I always, here's something I always, people always say Vince's way is the only way it could have succeeded. I disagree with that. I think that if Vince had different philosophies on wrestling, because all Vince did was he ran his father's territory pretty much the same that his dad did at first. Like 84 WWF has the DNA of, or of WWF, right? If Crockett had that territory. If it was the Crockett territory and Jim Crockett Jr. had that specific territory with all those towns, would his vision, if he had the same vision as Vince, would they have taken over? I I think I think that Hulk Hogan was such a generational talent. I agree with that. Uh, that it really I I lo- as much as I love Ric Flair, I just don't think that Ric Flair could have would have been able to do with what Hulk Hogan did because Hulk Hogan's charisma just translated into pop culture more so at the time than Flair's did. Now Flair has like all these years later. Um, I, I just think that it just it I think that just Vince and Hogan just had this magic about them together in the way they promoted it. And look, Hulk Hogan was very much a product of the Ronald Reagan era. Like it was just like big muscles, big action, pro America, pro USA, all that stuff. I th- I think it was just the, the perfect magic. And that's not me taking anything away from Flair, though. No, I think the flip side, I think if Flair has that machine behind him, and I think that's the thing with Hogan. It's Hogan was the right guy in the right time for that machine. But if Vince's philosophies were Crockett's philosophies, right? Could he have done that with Flair? Because Flair is also the quintessential 80s guy. Flair is, you know, Gordon Gecko with a bro. Yeah, that that right? is true. Yeah. So I think that if, if I truly believe it's the machine, now Hogan was the perfect thing for what Vince wanted to do. If Vince had, like I said, if Vince had more pro wrestling, traditionally based sensibilities with his ideas of promotion, because that's really what made it successful. It wasn't the wrestling. And that's what the, I think the misnomer that people have been convinced for years is that you need to be like Vince to do this. But the truth is Vince just did what he wanted, what he liked about pro wrestling. I think that if you had the muscle behind it, because that's because Crockett didn't have the vision. Right, nor do they have the money, but Vince had that new had that East Coast money, that Northeast mm-hmm. money. I think if Crockett had that Northeast money and that base and that vision, I think with Ric Flair, because you could tell me Ric Flair didn't in 1986 didn't ooze that didn't ooze confidence of himself. Oh, he, you think that you couldn't have put him on Johnny Carson or David Letterman and having him people eat out of his hands? You know what I'm I, saying? I, I think no, I think you could look. I when I say that it had to be Hogan, I'm not trying to downplay Ric Flair because Ric Flair, like if I had to pick between the two, I'm picking Flair all day, right? I just think that just Hulk Hogan was just, just so huge, so over the top. But I think you're right. I think one thing that WWF also had that Crockett could have never had, um, besides the money, was the New York media market. 100. percent That's what I'm saying. Yeah. If it was if Vince's sensibilities were Jim Crockett's. You know, like if Vince McMahon booked his territory the way Jim Crockett booked his territory, if it was more of a sense of wrestling, but then he put the pizzazz yeah. into it, could it have worked? Because I think that's the idea now is the only way wrestling can be big if it's the way yeah. that Vince did it. And I don't believe that. I think Vince just had the marketing push. He did. Because yeah. wrestling was popular. Wrestling was very popular in other parts of the country. And Crockett was there was times when he was neck and neck before he just business wise, he just wasn't the businessman Vince was No, And yeah, I don't he, think he was just way overspending and just way overspending doing all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that's an interesting question. I think we should probably pose it to our buddy. Um, because yeah. I, I, I think, I think had he, maybe if he booked and I think, I know what you're talking about, like just better matches and hotter angles. Mm-hmm. It's kind of what Crockett was doing. Um, could, could, could he have been able to do that? I, I, I think so. I think um, so too. I think so because I, you know, back then people like even WWF fans liked good matches. Like when they would throw, you know, you know, Tito Santana out there with Macho Man Randy, like those matches were good. You know, a lot of times the finishes weren't, but the matches were always really good, you know, or, or Bret Hart versus Ricky Steamboat and, and those types of matches. Let's go. Let's go to the early days of Vince Senior or Vince Junior. Tiger Mask and Dynamite Kid. Yeah, that was a match. WWF match. That was a yeah. Madison Square Garden match where. They had no idea who those two were. And by the end of the match, they were cheering them up and down. Like yeah. I, I, if you put, if you put that on MTV 
along with Hulk Hogan and Mr. T, uh, Mr. T and Cindy Lauper, why doesn't that get over? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I think, I think, I think it could. I here, here's a question. They brought this up in the documentary and I was wondering if you had ever heard this before Oh, wait a minute. Uh, when, when Vince, when Vince took over and uh, he immediately wanted to get rid of Backlund. Mm-hmm. And I think that, uh, I think a lot of people wanted him to get rid of Backlund. He was Backlund. People were sick of him. The fans were sick of him. The newsletters hated him by that point, by the end of his run there. And he said that his original, one of his early ideas to switch from, to get the belt off of Backlund was Dusty Rhodes. I had never heard that before. Had you ever heard that? I had not. Um, Vince says it, so I have to believe yeah. he thought it. Uh, they Dusty has that really hot run with Graham in 70, 78. 78. Thank you. Yeah, I wrote about it for Russell Joy. Yeah, he has a real hot run with Dusty in 78. That actually stretches. They do they, they ran the feud in, in WWF and they ran it again in Florida. So it was it was hot. Could they have gone with Dusty? I they could in that time. Now, here's the thing, too, is Vince is talking about 83-ish. So by 83, Dusty is already in the process of getting – he's booking Florida. He's about to take over North Carolina. He's about to take over the Carolinas. So I just don't think the stars were aligned because Dusty wasn't interested in coming in because he was going to run the show. He was going to run Crockett. Like, Starcade is his idea, and that's pre-Bat – that's Backlund. It's the end of Backlund. So he he does – Dusty wouldn't have worked because of what Dusty became in the next couple of years. Yeah. I, I could, I could see him wanting to go to Dusty. I just never heard the story that, that Dusty, like his original idea was Dusty. And then when he found out Hogan was available, um, well, Hogan wasn't available. Hogan just wasn't under contract. <laughs> so when he, so he, he, he went, he went for Hogan uh, instead, but he said that one of his early, I think that if he, if he could, he would have gone back to superstar Graham, but Graham was just shot by that point. He yeah. loved Graham. Yeah. That's the thing with Hogan. Hogan is Graham, but he Hogan was Hogan was Graham, but Hogan was better at being Graham than Graham was. And Graham yeah. has a great like people undervalue how successful Graham was as WWE champion in 80 in 77 and 78. Right? They the money would have been in turning Graham babyface. Yeah. And not in putting Backlund with the title. Cause like, it's funny too. Cause when Backlund becomes champion is when the WWF undercard is at its best. Cause Vince mm-hmm. has to, Vince senior has to do all this extra stuff to get asses in the seats because it's Backlund. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> that's when he brought Dusty and that's when he brought like Pantera. That's when, like they were bringing in guys from all over the place to try to make these cards really freaking cool because he just, you know, Backlund was kind of like Vince seniors, like early Roman, like remember how Roman was in like, or like maybe Cena, Right, because you know, Cena didn't click. With it's the fans. like it was Cena. Like after after a little bit, he uh, pushing him down your throat. He got sick of him. Yeah, well, they saw that about to happen with Roman, and they were like, "We're not going to let you." And that, right. and so Roman didn't get over until he turned heel. Right. So you could kind of compare like what what Backlund was was to like what Roman was at kind of the end. Like it was just they were actually it's a pretty good comparison actually. What what, yeah. what Vince Senior saw in Backlund is like very much what Vince saw in Roman. Vince just didn't book Roman right until Roman turned heel. Like yeah. The first like half of Roman Reigns is, you know, uh, dominance is is him as a failed baby face. So it's super interesting. I think that uh, I think wrestling is a different place if if Backlund doesn't get that ridiculously long title run. Yeah, five years. I, I, that. Yeah, I I I I think so. I think wrestling is a different place if uh if they just like you said flipped superstar Graham babyface because who knows what happened with with him like who knows if his life would have turned out the way that it did because well, like losing the belt really affected him mm-hmm. because he felt like he could continue to go and continue to contribute but they took the belt off of him because they had already had it in their head that they were going to go to Bob Backlund because they thought Bob Backlund was going to be their next Bruno and he just never turned out to be that no I just I mean he drew he drew you can't say Backlund wasn't drawing just by they kept the belt on him for too long yeah. They should have taken the belt off him in like 80, 81 and went with like Snooka or something like that when Snooka was Uh, raw. Yeah, but I don't think they could have gone with Snooka because he was, you know, and that, and I, so I I remember Piper would talking about um, Snooka because Snooka was the top baby face in the company, bigger, bigger than Backlund at the time. And he was like so mad that they wouldn't put the belt on Snooka because Snooka was the guy. And he's like, it made no sense. 
And then you find out what Snooker was up to. I was like, that's why they didn't put it on. They couldn't trust that guy with the belt. No, you're, you're right about that. But at the same time, like they could have just taken it off him. It's not like WWF yeah. didn't have guys that held the belt for like three days. Ivan yeah. Koloff holds, has the belt for a week. Stan Stasiak yeah. holds the belt for like uh, a weekend. Like they could have absolutely swung it around if they wanted to. Like, I get the point that you wanted the champion to be the guy, but they had transitional champs. The Iron Sheik has it for a month, you know? Mm. Yeah, so it's well, like... They- well, they didn't want to book Backlund versus Hogan, so no, and they no would have killed Backlund. Like it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked the way the transition it it worked. Like they actually, that's actually pretty well booked, to be honest yeah. with you. Like I, you can get on eighty four WWF booking, but that's not that's not a failure of it at all. No, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting to think about who if they don't get Hogan, who could they have gone with? Yeah, well, so and I think Dave talked about it in Wrestling Observer Radio that that you know he he also had never heard that Dusty was a guy that they had thought of. What they really who they really wanted was Kerry Von Eric. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Hogan was the best choice, but if they couldn't get Hogan, I think they they would have tried. They had been trying to get Kerry Von Eric for years, but like talk about Snuka, the Kerry Von Eric was up to some shenanigans at that time too. He couldn't have been trusted either. Kerry had in ring charisma. Kerry could not do the stuff that they had Hogan do. No. Kerry didn't have that level of charisma. You know, they could have gone with who was actually in the company at the time, who was the number two baby face in that era, Slaughter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought I they they absolutely could have gone with him, but I think then they ended up they had already went to Hogan by the time they had the dispute over G.I. Oh, Joe, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, yeah. and Hogan's like, yeah. And I'm saying like Slaughter's the number two baby face in 84. Yeah. When Hogan has his run, Slaughter's running those other towns mm-hmm. during Hogan, like the boot camp match with Hogan with uh, Patterson and Slaughter. That's during Hogan's reign, and Hogan's not on that show. That's just Slaughter. And, yeah, Slaughter, Slaughter, and Slaughter was the heel at that time. No, Slaughter was a baby face. It wasn't Slaughter heel against Patterson. I thought Slaughter was a well, who's Slaughter? The Slaughter was the heel against Patterson. The Slaughter second. turns baby face against the Sheik. Yeah, yeah. The second boot camp match, not the first one yeah. with Patterson. The other one is one with Slaughter's babies. And like Slaughter's the number two. Like that's why Slaughter gets the G.I. Joe run. Yeah. Is because he was that popular. Like he was the number two baby face in WWF at the time. And that's only 84 into into just beginning the 85. So I mean, you could have Slaughter is a guy they could have gone with. And then like maybe things are are different because like you're you think about how popular you have to be to have Hasbro reach out to you to go. Hey, we want you. And then to, yeah. to continue to be popular when you're not on WWF TV, Slaughter was a national star on Ganya's TV and <laughs> running indies. Like that's how yeah. I think we discount. I think because of how bad his career ended, people kind of forget just how hot Slaughter was. He was, he was insane. They, and his career did end on a whimper because he went to AWA and then at a certain point, AWA just sort of stops drawing altogether. Oh yeah. Not, the, com- and- the company's in shambles and he, they're doing the studio wrestling pan. They were doing pandemic wrestling with fake fans before it was cool. That's um, a 90. Yeah. That's, that's in, in like 90. And then they brought him over. what did you think about the section where they're talking about the uh, turning slaughter heel and doing the Baghdad war? I thought they handled that one pretty well. And they handled as good as they could. Vince trying to say, Oh, we had a hot angle. You didn't. It no. wasn't. It didn't draw. I, Vince is convinced. I think again. I think Vince is convinced himself. I think they handled that as well as they could have. I I I felt like by the end of it, like you got the impression that it was a really bad idea and it didn't draw, yeah. right? And I, I think because you you had the truth tellers, but I want to. I, I might have to go back and rewatch that episode again because I'm trying to remember. I think even Pritchard on that said that it turned out not to be a good idea. Oh, yeah. but I really, I really remember him defending it on his podcast and even continued the, the bullshit line that the reason why they, they left the football stadium, um, uh, well, Olympic stadium, sorry. They left the Olympic stadium to sports arena was because slaughter was getting death threats. Now I assume that he probably was getting some death threats, I but, believe that. but I don't think they moved it to the small arena because of the death threats. I think they moved the small arena because it didn't draw. Yes, here's the. I believe Slaughter was getting death threats in the fall of 1990 and the winter of 1991. Mike, do you remember how long Desert Storm lasted? So what, a week and a half? A week and a half. The war <laughs> yeah. is over by February. Yeah. WrestleMania, as always, is in early April. So, I mean, it was over. And then the fact they kept trying, they went with it up till SummerSlam. Yeah. Like Vince just, he just loved those, like, just like his old man, just th- those, you know. Uh, xenophobic tropes like it just it was a bad idea and it was the amazing part is how long they ran it for 
Yeah, because it it really it it didn't draw, and then then they just kept going with it because they just had this idea. And they're like, oh well, you know, well people will will get behind it eventually. And then they completely killed Slaughter's career after that because they turned him babyface in '92, and then he was just completely done at that point. But he's but he also retires at that point. Like '92 yeah. is his last year in the ring, and by that point too, Slaughter Slaughter used to be really athletic. Like you watch those matches in the early '80s from the Mid Atlantic stuff and the boot camp match and all those kind of things. He was an athletic moving dude. He could work. Yeah. He could bump. Like Slaughter was pretty awesome. Uh, by 90, he's not pretty awesome anymore. Like he had gotten fat. He'd work a lot of, he worked a lot of indie shows, you know, the AWA. So he wasn't doing stuff. He was very happy with his GI Joe money. I spent <laughs> money. I spent money on a, a video when I was a kid. I think I might've got it for birthday. It was Sergeant, it was Sergeant Slaughter and a bunch of dudes. I don't know doing a tug of war with Bigfoot. Not the monster, but the monster truck. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I spent, like, that was a big thing when I was a kid. That's how over Slaughter was, was him and Bigfoot managed to sell, the uh, fell out of this major VHS thing. So that's, yeah, it's never discount Slaughter's, how over Slaughter was. Yeah, it, yeah, no, he was, uh, he was super over. He was, you know, of the 80s, it was, as far as, like, names from wrestling that kind of transcended pop culture it was hogan and slaughter it was and i think at, at the time because what, the, because of the show i think what hurts slaughter is that championship run yeah i really do yeah yeah no it, it, it def, definitely did but uh man we could talk about this shit oh, forever yeah. but we've already we've already gone over our a lot of time um but i was anxious to hear your thoughts on the documentary so i'm glad you were able to Glad you're yeah. able to watch it. Um, if for those of you listening to this and you did get a chance to watch it, drop a comment and let us know what you thought about it. Um, I'm curious to see what other people think about it too. Um, I, I think, I think this is going to go down as probably the biggest wrestling documentary like ever. I agree mm -hmm. because of the platform that it's on. Mm -hmm. And so when people think of wrestling documentaries, they're going to think of the McMahon documentary, and that's going to be telling the the history of McMahon, history of WWE, and then also, you know, touching on all the scandals um, that happened with him and probably leaving a lasting impression that this is like a horrible human being. So, um, so I, I think, I think that's where it ends, you know, eventually once this Janelle Grant case is over, I don't think Netflix does an addendum to this, but I think, I think they like should. a legitimate, a, le a legitimate news outlet or maybe a different platform is going to have to do more of a true crime style documentary. And I just watched a really good one on the, um, on the night stalker on, mm -hmm. uh, on Netflix. That's really good. R Richard Ramirez. I thought they did a really good job on that one. Um, talking about like, you know, they, they actually went into his childhood and kind of explained like, Hey, maybe this is why this guy was the way he was. Right. Um, but explaining the manhunt, explaining how they got to where they're going. There's another one coming out about the Zodiac that I'm really interested in. So I like the true crime stuff too. So I, I hope, I hope that we get a true crime version of the story, but I think they have to wait to find out what happens at the end of it before they can do that. We're still probably a year or two away from wherever this thing winds up and there could be some more twists and turns. Yeah. In this whole thing before it's all done. Yeah. Because, you know, I think eventually some of those NDAs that got signed and some of those wrestlers, I think those are going to come out and those people are going to get the chance to tell their stories eventually. Um, and when we'll, we'll see what happens with that, but somebody that that's really good at the true crime stuff needs to, needs to follow up on this. I agree. But uh, Hey guys, that is going to do it for us on overtime. I hope you guys enjoyed it. The next thing I want to do, JD, we, I have two, I have two ideas. What's that? Um, I want to do the Hogan Flair 94 series. We've been kicking that. Yeah. Yeah. We've been kicking that. So I, I want to do that. But on the WWE vault tonight, they did one hour from uh, the Omni WCW or NWA in the Omni from like 1987. Um, unfortunately, they only did one hour. They only had one hour of the footage and they actually didn't get to Barry Windham versus Ric Flair, the 60 minute draw that happened on that night. Um, so, but I think it's still really cool. So may, maybe if you get a chance to watch it, maybe we'll just talk about it on the regular pod this coming up week. And then next time we're on overtime, we'll just do the Hogan and Flair. Series. I, I think that on the regular pod this week, we should talk about the hall of fame and do an overview. Cause we got the ballots. We should, I think for you and I, I think we need to work through this and like, really, I don't want to just vote. Cause I feel like we've yeah. been given like a, a legit responsibility and like, oh, I'm, I'm going to, yeah, so, I'm doing. I'm gonna do like legit research, and then uh, yeah, I so I think we should talk about it because I I don't know how much our audience is super in tune 
with what Dave does in the observer. Cause I think we got a lot of impact fans and a lot of them aren't don't love, like I think a lot of them think Dave slights impact sometimes. So I don't know how much, yeah. I think we need to educate our fan base on what the hall of fame ballot looks like and how yeah. things have to be done. I think we owe that this week to, to our yeah. fan base. Yeah. And I, I think we'll, we'll definitely cover the hall of fame. Um, but I would like to do a separate episode that I is agree. just about the hall of fame where we're talking about our ballots, kind of like what we did last year. So we should no, absolutely. We should and, absolutely do it. We should do yeah. like, that should be like a thing. We should absolutely do an episode on this year's hall of fame going over the ballot. And then we should actually do our research, come back. And before, when, before the ballots are due, we yeah. should do who we're voting for. And like, yes. like we did last year, try to sell each other and like make each other defend our choices. Yeah. Maybe so bring I think, I, to tell us that we're stupid. You know? Yeah. I, I, so I think, I think, yeah, we'll introduce the ballot this, this week. Um, if you get a chance to watch the Omni I'm thing, gonna watch, right? I'm going to watch yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I'm probably going to do it. I'm probably just going to like, as soon as I'm done here, I'm probably just going to go watch it. Um, so if you get a chance to check it out, then maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then whatever else the news is out there this coming up week, uh, next time on overtime, Hogan and Flair series. And then, uh, at some point before the hall of fame ballots are due, uh, we'll do a full blown hall of fame show. And maybe we'll try to get a guess or two. I think I'm we'll, down. Let's do it. Yeah. All right, man. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here on Patreon. Thank you for being subscribers. I greatly appreciate you. Um, that's going to do it for us this week. And until next time, mahalo. I want to see something really scary. Attention. Do I have everybody's attention?